project, the project is not required anymore. Uh, that, that's the speed at which it would work. Because while there is a good intention, the red tape in most of these kind of structures, uh, you know, doesn't allow things to progress. But if you are in your own individual environments, parish priests, heads of institutions, you are in a position to respond because your ability to respond is in that local group area and you can do things. But your documentation is important. Videos of the work that you're doing, uh, keep that because it always helps. Photographs of what's been taken today with your phone, you have the ability for photographs, for videos, and of course your accounts because that shows the transparency of how you are operating and uh, it helps people to, to understand that. This, the next point I'd like to make is, uh, if your institute is for a specific purpose like education, and this is, I'm now also the manager of a school. So ensure that the, the, the funds of your institution are used for the specific target group of that. And there are plenty of benefits that you can get by way of the government with regards to what you are doing if you run a school, for example. Uh, so like take, for example, one of the things that we did in, in our school, because we knew that students would have, uh, you know, I, I know what I'm saying might be extremely uh, controversial and might cause some people to have a bit of a heart attack, but I will say it anyway. Uh, the, there, if, an ins, if a school can tell me that they have no funds, it means that they're not running the school properly. Every school has sufficient of reserves that will last them for three to five years without them taking fees from anyone. That is something that I'm very clear about. I thought I was running a school that was very poor. And I'm telling you, I can run my school for five years without taking funds at all, without taking fees at all. So I know that there is funds available in schools if I'm running a, a poor school, technically. Okay, so use your, your, your institutional funds for the specific target group for what your institute is. Like in my case, I have a school. So I use the funds of the school to help school students of all faiths in my school. So what we did in the course of the year was we created, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we gave them the free books so that they could have the education going on the whole year, uh, the notebooks, the workbooks, the school books, we gave it free. And then because we gave things free to the students when the pandemic was raging last year, the beginning of June, uh, when we said, look, if you are in a position to pay some fees, please pay we got 90% fees back into the school. So because they saw us being generous in our approach when the pandemic was raging, when, when, when things eased off and the restrictions were lifted and people could start working again, uh, the, the reality was we received 90% of our fees back uh, during the year when in the primary section and the secondary, they, they made contributions to, to help the Institute. Uh, so what the other things that we did was we created Wi-Fi zones. Now I know with the lockdown, it doesn't work too well, but we created Wi-Fi zones because in very, uh, so students would come and sit in the church compound and utilize the Wi-Fi to do their homework and online classes because that was something that they didn't have. Uh, and we documented uh, everything that was going on because this year when the property tax papers came in, we showed the records of what we have spent and they have wavered off we had an eight lakh uh, property tax for the school. They, they made us pay a, pay a lakh only because they, we showed it as relief measures that we did during the pandemic and the BMC through a process, they give you a whole lot of paperwork that you have to do. Uh, we got exemptions in a lot of areas because of this. So we utilize that. Uh, the next area that I'm suggesting is, uh, you know, the uh, Center for Social Action has started something called the Young Warriors Initiative. Uh, the Young Warriors Initiative is a training program to help young people uh, help disperse rumors and address issues with regards to vaccination, with regards to the virus, with regards to, so they get a proper training uh, that is uh, funded by the United Nations. And in that training, they are given a whole list of, if these are the questions, this is the answer in various languages. So they can help with WhatsApp groups. It's, it's a very well-versed trained program. Father Mario uh, had created this whole program in, uh, in collaboration with the UNICEF, I think. And it's a, it's a beautiful initiative about 
uh, 10 of my slum based community people have got involved in this program and they are effectively utilizing the information that they have uh, with regards to this program. The next is, of course, uh, tie up with the local leaders. So, you see, I think all of us who have schools get tremendous amount of pressure every time for admissions. Now it's our time to turn around and say, how can we help you in terms of reaching out to people? What can we do by way of our institutions? Uh, and it has a tremendous different impact with them. The moment I've shown the willingness to work with them, uh, you know, uh, the Shish Sena have gone out of the way to create infrastructures so that they can uh, ensure vaccination goes on. That's their whole approach. So they've looked at our center, they've looked at other centers uh, as to where they can actually have vaccination drives. And uh, Mahim is one, an example of it working. But they've looked at all our institutions in the area. And because we showed the willingness, they are extremely cooperative in assisting us in all different kinds of issues that are there. So the other uh, area that I've worked with with our young people is that we've created a registration help desk uh, for you know, senior citizens who have a difficulty. So they, they send us the Aadhaar card in, then we try to make sure that we can, the young people who are quick with their fingers uh, and know how to do this whole registration thing, manage to do this registration. And then we, we have created the pool of uh, parishioners who have vehicles and we have a transportation pool for them uh, so that they can be taken, the senior citizens can be taken to the, uh, you know, vaccination center that is nearest by. Uh, the other concerns that have come up, and this is something that we've addressed, was uh, you know, providing basic quarantine centers with, for people with small houses. Uh, one of the biggest issues is, in, in my area, the average size of the house is about, uh, you know, 15 by 15. And there are five to six people staying out there. So if one person gets it, the whole family gets it. So uh, thankfully, the quarantine centers that have been set up by the BMC are doing extremely well and are extremely effective. But uh, some way or the other way, asymptomatic people can, you know, but this has to be a collaborative effort with the local leaders because then BMC gets involved. They provide the doctor, they provide the healthcare, they provide uh, the facilities that are required uh, and they are extremely effective and efficient in getting things done. So that is an area that you could look at, consider. Uh, the last area is this, uh, and this is, you know, uh, chase the virus is, uh, is the idea, is to ask uh, survivors to tell their story of how they recover. One of the biggest issues that I have faced is that people tend to hide the fact that they've got the illness and because they've hid it for so long, the virus then reaches a point where it's gone into the lungs and then, uh, you know, most of the time it's resulted in deaths. And from all that I've listened from the medical experts, I think Father, uh, Dr. Richard will bear me out too, is early detection results in a faster cure. So this whole fear that I've got corona and I'm frightened because I've got corona, therefore I have to hide it, has caused much more harm then actually treating it at the very early stage, as soon as there are some kind of symptoms testing, this, this whole uh, aspect, and, and this is something that I had to address as a, as a priest, because I've had people who have uh, tested positive, gone to the quarantine center, stayed out there at the quarantine center, came back from the quarantine center uh, negative, but were not accepted back into the community by the, by the building people because of common toilets and the fear that, you know, uh, they would probably spread the virus. So uh, that required me to intervene, talk to them, say, okay, can we just look at one toilet that we give totally to this family and say the rest of it, you know, y'all use. So they, we had to work out some kind of agreement that allowed it. And then we helped with, you know, in getting the BMC to come and sanitize the building, sanitize the area. So it, we had to do a lot of interventions at these levels. But this is where the willingness to put yourself out there. And of course, like I said, it, once, once survivors start telling their story of treatment early, uh, not afraid of, of getting yourself checked out, uh, checked up, not hiding the, the reality, because the whole thing is people tend to hide. What will my neighbor say if I have Corona? 
Uh, what will other people say if I have corona? All these kind of issues are constantly out there. Uh, and if you could create a small video, in fact, a lot of our, a lot of our people, uh, you know, uh, don't communicate about coronavirus and things that way. And they try to hide it. And, uh, and when they hide it, it's only made things worse. So that would be the overall thing. So from the archdiocesan platforms, what we can do is we do have an outreach of, uh, you know, close to one lakh people that, but it's mainly the Christian community that we are addressing. Therefore, it's not a thing that we can touch other people of other faiths right through. So we can communicate, we can touch a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, and it's important that we make it into uh, uh, small bites that are, that are in, a, in a situation where people can consume it. So therefore small bits of information. If you have people from your own community who, or people who are respected, or you know, like take for example, when I spoke to my parishioners and said, look, I had, I, I had the virus, I was corona positive, this is the action that I took, this is the time frame, it, it kind of this thing. It made a difference to them because they said, okay, if the parish priest can happen to get it and then, uh, you know, uh, respond to the given situation, then what's wrong with us doing it? So if there are people in positions and authorities who have got it, and many of us have, through no fault of us, you know, we've got it. Talk about it. Talk about the fact that it is curable. It's nothing to be feared because the real, the reality that I, and, and your hats off to so many of you in the congregations who are giving food or responding to the needs. I know, you know, uh, some of you because of that outreach and a couple of you have might have contracted it. Uh, the convent gates have been sealed. We've heard those stories also. So hats off for going out there and putting yourself at the service of people. Uh, that, is, that is the need of the hour. But if we were, I mean, and, and this is something that I take courage uh, from Pope Francis. He says the church should look like a field hospital. But right now, uh, please don't misunderstand these words. To me right now, the church is looking like a retired clergy home where everyone has locked themselves in their houses and refusing to act uh, in compassion in given circumstances. It is few people who are risking themselves and doing it out there and are willing to put themselves on the line. And I leave you with this last thought and I'm open for questions out here. Like I said, I have no answers and I'm not sure whether my answers are the right answers. Uh, what's the worst possible thing that can happen? You die. But I'm preaching the resurrection of Christ. What's frightening about that? I mean, I'm, I'm standing up at every funeral and talking about life has not ended. So what's terrifying about that? And what's stopping me from responding? And I think that's where our faith has to be seen in action because we're, we're extremely good preachers. Maybe we stop there. So any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, Just give me a moment. Moderator, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, one second, one second, let him come back. So we have a little time for the questions and uh, get the questions. We didn't stop him, did we? Yeah? No, no, he, he just... didn't stop him. Sorry. His bell rang. Yeah, yeah, yeah my bell rang, sorry. I, I don't know, we didn't ring the bell. I do. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I, my okay. bell rang because someone came yeah. to put some medical supplies for yeah. the work. We have the the Central Industrial Reserve Police Force on our premises uh, for quarantine. They were on election duty. So I offered the school for a quarantine facility for them. So uh, Aman has donated uh, a medical setup to assist them because there were two of them who tested positive. So uh, the parishioners are responding. Sorry. Anoila has a question. Yes, sir. Nigel, thank you for your very daring talk. I enjoyed it because it's very informative. There are a couple of things I'd like to get some more information about. Yeah. One is, uh, you say the Young Warriors Initiative, no? Yes. Where yes. they dispel misinformation. and How do you contact them? Is there a number yeah. which you so, can... Uh, what I'll do is I'll share with you, or I'll put it right now, the, the PDF that Father Mario, I can, I can put it up onto the chat out here. Yeah. There is a Google link that uh, you can fill up the form. And then they contact you and they help you out with a training program. And then they give you a set of questions and answers. I think it's in what five languages. Okay. Thank you. That will be very useful. Yeah. And the second thing you said, there's a registration out desk. 
Yeah, so basically, how do we get to yeah, that? Yes, no, no, registration. This is the parish initiative where my people are senior citizens, where they are having a difficulty registering because you know they don't know how to handle OTPs, Aadhaar cards, all those mm -hmm. kind of things for the vaccination. So, what happens is that uh, since I have put a high speed internet facility in the church compound so that we have a Wi Fi zone so that people can do their studies and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have done is basically the young people, uh, the information is sent in by the animators with the Aadhaar card. Uh, today you can use one phone for, for four Aadhaar cards to do the registration. So we, we've been basically assisting, registering, getting an OTP, putting it down, scheduling a, a vaccination, and then coordinating with a team of people who uh, help the persons drive to the vaccination center. Thank you. Other queries to Nigel? If nobody has another question, I would like to put something on. Sure, sure. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, you know, this conscientized program that you've talked of is very important. Conscientization to get rid of fear. The stigma, huh? that is what you say. Yes. And also, conscientization program, because in the slums, they don't know what it means to wear a mask. They don't know COVID appropriate behavior. So I'm, um, I'm really looking for some kind of a program that would help us to get into slums. I belong to a, an education NGO and we send our people out into the slums. And uh, yes, we have to, and they are already in the different communities talking about it. But till date, I haven't got any, you know, kind of a program with modules, you know. I mean, I don't want something absolutely formal, but uh, what to do? You know, we have 80 people to go into slums, but uh, yes, it's all, you know, like uh, as and when you not feel like it, but uh, something that is more, uh, should I say, tangible and with hands-on experience. Have you something to say about that? Uh, so one of the things is, of course, I think this Young Warriors Initiative, I've just uploaded the file onto the chat box. Yeah. Uh, so the Young Warriors Initiative is a place which does have these kind of Q&As. Again, uh, intervention, one of the things that has happened, see, the, uh, the issue, all honestly, is that in our own communities and our own places, while we say the need for mass, need for mass, you have a look at any of our communities when we are having any of our services, including my own community, the mask is below the chin yeah. and you're know, speaking into the mic, yeah. you know, so uh, it's not just a slum based community that requires some kind of education that all of us require an education on the need for it. But uh, I think that the CSA Young Warriors has got this specific question and answer, uh, but uh, there are a, a lot of uh, WHO videos with regards to uh, how one could use the mask and things that way. I could source this out and they are in, in multiple languages. I also know that the government has got, the Maharashtra government has got a very good uh, uh, program as part of their My Family, My Responsibility setup, which is extremely uh, effective in communicating in Marathi and Hindi. I've, I, I've seen a couple of these short videos and I can source it out for you. Thank you. Nigel, I have a query uh, with regard to the survivors uh, telling the tale. How did you organize it? Was it online and, and no, uh, yeah, so, platform and things like that? And how, if somebody else would like to do that, how would they like to do it? So what we asked them to do is to tell their story. We gave them three questions. We said, look into your, into your mobile phone and tell the story. We gave them specifics about that. And then I put it together of all the survivors of my parish because it was a parish initiative. Mainly to tell people, look, uh, because I've had situations with, like I lost my office clerk uh, because I, when, when uh, from April onwards, I shut the office and said, please don't come to work. This person was coming and sitting in the marketplace because he liked to sit and talk to his friends. And no one knew how bad he was because he was a bachelor. Uh, and, you know, finally I came to know that uh, he, he's not keeping well, he's coughing. And uh, the people in the society getting upset with him. So no one was even wanting to go to his house to uh, help him, uh, take him to hospital. Thankfully, believe me, 
uh, whatever one might say about the Shiv Sena and anything else, the thing I'd like to say is. Uh, whatever one might say about the Shiv Sena, the war room of the BMC has been brilliant. I called up the war room. They sent an ambulance. They picked him, picked the person up, took him to hospital. Uh, they uh, got him tested. When they found he was COVID positive, they shifted him to a COVID uh, hospital. Uh, they took him from my church to Biker to JJ Hospital. Everything done within two hours of the call made to the the war room. So the local BMC war rooms have been extremely effective. At least my local war room. Oh, I don't know about other local war rooms, but my local uh, war rooms have been extremely effective. So what I did was I sent this category of what you should record and then sent them the list of questions. They recorded it and then we started circulating it amongst our communities to help people uh, know that the the quicker you respond to a given situation, the faster is uh, your healing. Yeah, there's a hand raised, Sister Pauline. Yeah, please ask, Sister yes. Pauline. You mentioned you that. Mentioned that there are there are many people in the same community using the. Uh, because of the echo, we just cannot make out what our sister is asking. Uh, so <laughs> we just cannot make out. Uh, hello? You may uh, mark that the Oh my God. Uh, Sister Pauline, could you uh, ask someone to put it on the chat? We will uh, relay it to Father Nigel later. Uh, uh, we will be able to respond to it later because you know the the, the, the voice yeah. is not coming through. What's the question? I see. Okay. You made a remark that the church is like a retired clergy home. Now, do you mean that? The institutional church, the official church, because we are also part of the church, and you yourself are doing so much. So, what do you mean by this? Okay, so I'll I'll be honest enough to say that you know, in general, I think fear is, uh, the fear psychosis has got the better of all of us. And if you look at the percentage of people who are willing to put themselves out there in the service of others, I would say uh, in general, if you look at diocese. See, the fear is everyone is talking about we lost 10 people, we lost 20 people, we lost 30 people in every diocese. Uh, yes, you're going to lose people when you're fighting a war. That's going to happen. But it doesn't mean that we start stop doing anything in the service of people. Now, my, my thing is, yes, individually, I think a lot of people are doing a lot of good work. There is a lot of goodwill. There is a desire, but the lack of knowledge as to what we can do and how we can do things. And there's also the fact that I have to be responsible because I'm living in a community that has, uh, you know, people with comorbidities, people who have, so I, I don't dispute these things. So in our own communities, if we have people who say, I'm gonna be at service, but we can create isolation post wards for them because they shouldn't affect someone else because they've gone out onto the streets and have been working out there. They shouldn't be coming back and, you know, infecting people with comorbidities. We have to create an infrastructure in our own organizations because uh, we do have the, the space in our institutions. I mean, I had it, I have two senior priests with me, but I have a room that I can isolate myself. So there's no problem at all. And I can have my meals kept at my door and I can eat my meals. Uh, there is no problem again, but it's not the same with people in houses who are staying five of them in one small cubicle. So when I say the church has become like a clergy home, uh, I, I agree, it's all the whole church, not just the institutional church. I'm just saying the fear psychosis has got the better of most of us. And I understand that, which is why I said the final remark was, would be, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we're all gonna, we all gonna die. 
Yeah, thanks, Nigel. Um, uh, the, uh, thanks for that input and also for uh, answering our queries. Uh, uh, I mean, giving us very clear and concrete kind of steps that we could take. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions. That's why I'm going on to the next speaker. Uh, I'm inviting Noella to introduce the speaker to us. Noella, please unmute yourself. The next speaker is also an excellent speaker. He heads the Archdiocese in COVID Health Helpline. And Dr. Richard is going to tell us about how we could join forces under this scheme. It's very, very well planned. And uh, as with uh, 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 Nigel, he's going to tell us how it affects all of us and how we can work under it. Dr. Richard is a dental surgeon who has specialized in periodontics. He is in private practice for the last uh, 20 years. He's also an ex-professor of the NGM Dental College in Navi, Mumbai. Currently, he is a consultant in Holy Family Hospital, and he is the project coordinator of the Archdiocese in Health Outreach Program. Dr. Richard, over to you. Thank you, Sister Noella. Am I audible, Sister? Yes, very well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, share a few thoughts on this obligation, uh, specifically to talk about the COVID helpline. Well, uh, it's important to understand how the idea of the COVID helpline uh, originated. Uh, we are a team of uh, doctors who have initiated a project called the Health Outreach Project uh, way back in December under uh, the initiative of uh, Bishop Alvin and the leadership of Dr. Armida Fernandez. So the six doctors came together, Dr. Giselle Page, Dr. Cheryl uh, D'Souza, Dr. Cedric Moraes, Mr. Florencio, and Dr. Ruin Mascarinus. I've got a wonderful team. We came together uh, to do this health outreach, which basically facilitates healthcare facilities to the poorest of poor and the migrants. So that is our core area of work we've been doing since December with various parishes and the coordinators of various parishes. Uh, when the pandemic uh, second wave surge picked up in the month of April, uh, Bishop Baldwin uh, asked us what could we do as a health outreach to mitigate the uh, problems faced because of the surge. And as uh, Father Nigel very rightly pointed out, speed of action is very important. Uh, and I must tell you, in 24 hours, we put together this whole concept of a COVID helpline because uh, we felt that at that point in time, there was a dire need for information. And so the helpline basically, which was constructed on the 26th of April, had three arms. The first arm was concerning teleguidance uh, to anyone who wanted to con connect with a doctor. Because at that point, when cases were surging, people were frustrated, desperate, they wanted to talk to any doctor about uh, you know, the normal pulse ox readings, what, if, what do I do if I have fever, where do I go? So just talking to a doctor was uh, a very comforting uh, thought. So the first arm uh, was teleconsultation with doctor. The second arm was information, trying to provide as much information as we could during that peak time, information on beds, oxygen cylinders, RT-PCR centers, any kind of information related to COVID. And the third arm was something to do with mental health services. So anyone affected with uh, the mental health, uh, panic attacks and you know, uh, getting frustrated because of that, uh, because of COVID, we had five psychiatrists uh, consulting with them on the phone, talking to them on their mental health issues. So these three arms were the COVID. Uh, Believe it or not, the calls, we were inundated with calls in the first couple of days, and we had no choice but to expand the whole helpline. So from a few volunteers of three and five uh, uh, volunteers, uh, we had to go to almost 10 to 12 volunteers. And we were really blessed to have so many lay uh, persons come forward and be part of this uh, exercise because uh, uh, you know receiving calls and uh, you know it's a big big process 
and we had uh, our own panel of doctors, uh, seven, eight doctors to answer. So there was a whole team which got together and we expanded that team just because we had uh, an increase a number of calls which came in. Now, uh, I must tell you about the information arm of, okay, let's start with the first arm with the doctors. Uh, the USP uh, or the mark of, of uh, uh, this COVID helpline, it had, and we wanted it to be a kind of a, have a Christian touch to it. So uh, we were very, very clear that when we talk to our patients or the doctors talk to our patients, we have to have that compassion. And, uh, you know, till date in these two weeks, we've had uh, almost thousand calls uh, reach our helpline. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, so many calls to our doctors, but every call attended by our doctors were very personalized. We spent a lot of time talking to the patients, uh, understanding them, comforting them, both the counselors as well as the uh, physicians who spoke to uh, uh, patients. In fact, uh, I must even, uh, as a footnote, mention that one of our doctors contracted uh, COVID, but she was so committed that even from a hospital bed, she continued to serve in the teleguidance role. And I asked, I said, doctor, you want to take a break? Because she said, no, it's, 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 it's so rewarding just, uh, you know, disseminating information to, to patients at, at, uh, at this point in time. So that was a level of commitment, uh, uh, you know, and the mark of the, the Christian service, which was the hallmark of this uh, helpline. The second arm, uh, I must say, um, was different from all the information that was circulating on WhatsApp and Google. There was tons of information. But what we were blessed with, and I always say, when God guides, he provides. He provided us a connection, a collaboration with Father Leon, Leon Cruz from uh, Don Bosco, who got on board uh, 50 plus of his youth. And he was looking to do a project for the youth. The youth wanted to do a project. So I said, why don't you come on board and help us with this second arm of information? So we, we developed this arm where youth were actually calling up information, verifying data. So the data was real time and it was authentic, unlike many of the numbers which were circulating on, on WhatsApp. So that is another hallmark of, of this uh, helpline. So real time data and authentic data, thanks to the services of the Don Bosco youth and their team, their massive team of 50 plus youngsters. And the third arm was the uh, mental uh, health arm, which again was uh, receiving calls and you know, got a lot of counseling and things like that. And just five uh, days back, we opened our fourth arm uh, and that was the prayer line. I must talk about that itself also because the prayer line was to talk to people on a spiritual basis, pray with them, all those who wanted spiritual and healing counseling. So besides the mental health counseling from the, from the medical point of view, if you just wanted to pray with us, we had a whole group of uh, seven, eight professional uh, counselors from the uh, charismatic renewal from various prayer groups coming and offering their services. And I'm very proud of that arm as well. We've already received 30, 40 calls where people have called in and asked for prayers. Why I bring this up? Because, because that is also, I believe, a very integral part of this helpline where we're kind of reaching out to every kind of dimension of a, a caller who calls in. Uh, having said that, and uh, you know, put this whole uh, COVID help in, I must say yes, uh, from the second week onwards, there was a kind of a decline in the calls. And I attribute uh, probably several reasons to that. Uh, number one is probably the, the panic phase in the, in the mid month of April kind of died down, it weighed down. Uh, so probably the callers were less. Uh, I also attribute probably the BMC facilities, uh, whatever, however we may criticize them. I think the BMC under uh, uh, Commissioner Chehel has done a good job, you know, with the war rooms and you know the systems uh, uh, he has put in place. So that probably also could be a reason. Uh, there were also a mushrooming of similar such services uh, we found uh, in the days to come. So exactly like what Father said, speed of action. I think we got into it at the right time and we could service 1,000 calls so far. We're still doing that, but it's much lesser now because of various reasons. Uh, but if there was anything I were to ask our church uh, for help in, would be, I feel that somehow we have not been able to promote the helpline uh, uh, in, a, in, in a big way at all. 
uh, the information and knowledge about the helpline did not percolate to the parish level. The parish priests probably didn't know about it. So the local parishioners didn't know about it. And this was, uh, 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 um, uh, I can say, because of interacting with a few people across the city. And they say, no, we didn't know about your helpline. Do you have something like this? Uh, you know, I had the opportunity last, uh, I think, a week ago to attend a, a forum with uh, Sister Noella and a lot of uh, eminent uh, persons from the Archdiocese were present on the forum and none of them knew about the helpline. So somewhere there has been a lack of uh, communication and uh, dissemination of information. So people have not known and I really believe that if even today, if we uh, find out how we could make this public uh, to the various uh, uh, parishes, to our various uh, churches in Mumbai and uh, let our parishioners there locally know about it. I'm sure again, there will be a, uh, at least a substantial amount of uh, calls coming in again. So uh, uh, this was the basic uh, uh, construct of the uh, helpline. And uh, again, about the second arm, you know, uh, it, it is, it's all nice to say that you know the helpline broadly looks great but there's a lot of lot of work uh, at every uh, level you know the youngsters i must say they really worked hard they were given time slots at different points of time uh, they faced so many challenges uh, uh, you know just talking to vendors when they had to verify information they had to call up vendors you know you get a you get a backlash from the vendors you're like non cooperative non compliant people who are unwilling to share information so these youngsters had to put up with a lot of nonsense, but I tell you, uh, it's nothing but the grace of God uh, behind this initiative. And I have no qualms in always saying that everywhere when he guides, he always provides and he's been kind. And this has been, uh, uh, you know, even our doctors who really spoke, it's tiring, you know, when they have their own practices to give off service and the uh, time slots and getting those calls, talking to them. Uh, and we made it very clear that it's not going to be just, you know, pointing a finger or information, but actually, uh, with compassion dealing with every single caller because every single caller has been uh, indirectly or directly affected with COVID. So we have to have a Christ-like compassion in any of it. And I, I'm proud to say that from the doctors to the volunteers, they've been very, very kind. And even if our callers, uh, you know, made it the point to the help desk, made it a point to come and go back to the caller and ask, how are things, you know, uh, you know, how you had a call last time, how are things, have you met? Because when the calls got lesser, and there was a wane in the number of calls. So we had more time. So they actually called them back and said, you know, so many people died. Uh, many people couldn't get uh, died because of lack of oxygen or whatever, whatever. And because of that, we had even in between, we had a prayer service uh, and a whole one hour prayer service for all of those people. So we actually put our heart and soul into this whole initiative and it was not just another uh, helpline that you see across uh, so many platforms. With that, uh, sister, I open to any questions if there are. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Richard, for this enlightening uh, uh, kind of uh, talk about the information. One thing also we you very clearly mentioned to us is uh, that uh, uh, how all of us can actually uh, publicize the information in our own platforms. Um, uh, to, before I get to the questions of others, uh, could you also tell us how we, uh, many of us now, many of us are now present here, how we can uh, chip in with uh, this initiative? So, uh, like I said, uh, Father, it's just letting, uh, I mean, how did we circulate it? I mean, uh, uh, we just sent it to our local networks, all the people we knew. So I think one way is everyone does it through their own personal contacts and their databases is one. But if somehow, I don't know how the communication uh, works at the uh, church level, but if every parish priest, Yeah, we are having a little uh, connection issue with doctor. You can hear me? Yeah, you can hear me? Yeah, fine. Now it's fine. So I said if every parish priest can actually say go out to, you know, there's a poster put out in the in the, in the the uh, foyer, you know, with the helpline numbers. I think that would be a great help to the local, uh, to the every parish knew about this. One, uh, 122 parishes. So I'm saying if that message gets across, that will be a great help. I'm wondering whether the CRI Expo team could help in this. After the poll question. Through the CRI, if you could disseminate this uh, information. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It could be it could be done. It could be done. So we won't take an answer. 
I have a question. Yes. To question, suggestion, or whatever. Uh, I find this uh, COVID helpline is vital, and it has to be publicized. Now, the same way you have got your whole uh, team work, I think we have to get back to the archdiocesan structure through Alvin to get to the community centers of each parish and have a kind of a webinar like this, you know, telling them what's at stake. The community centers and the SVPs are the one who disseminate knowledge everywhere. And I think that's imperative at this moment that uh, we do something like that. Maybe you could suggest it to Alvin because yes, you know, by word of mouth, one person, second person, but if this is disseminated on a formal scale, right through the, the archdiocese in an evening, why not? And I find that very important. Thank you, doctor. It was a very enlightening talk. Thank you, sir. Yeah, there is a suggestion which has come from Manisha Gunzagish. Uh, regarding the helpline, it would be timely right now. I suggest a good effective way is through the SCC structures, reaching out to clusters, etc., to the grassroots. Bishop Barkol could be contacted too for disseminating the information. Very good. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Dr. You. Richard. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we go to the third presentation. Noela, take over. Uh, the next presentation is also somebody who is very eminent and who's worked a lot in the public health sector for many decades. Uh, she is Dr. Armida Fernandez, who is the ex-dean of Sion Hospital. And she's going to tell us how we can reach the most vulnerable and underprivileged sections of society. The vaccination program, conscientization of slum dwellers. Unfortunately, she's not able to be with us today due to, uh, sorry, uh, due to tuck, tuck, Thai, I think that's the way you pronounce it, striking unrelentlessly in Goa. And uh, in a moment of foresight, she sent us a video recording of her talk. So should anybody like to ask her a question, please note it in the chat section. She will willingly and gladly answer your questions and you will get your answer through an email through, of course, the CRI. So Dr. Armeda has worked in the health sector for over five decades. That has spanned medical colleges of the municipal corporation, charitable private hospitals and the social sector. She was a professor of neonatology and retired as Dean of the Sion Hospital and LTMM Medical College attached to the hospital in Sion in Mumbai. She was also the medical director of Holy Family Hospital in Bandra. In 1999, she moved from Sion Hospital into the neighboring slum, Dharavi, and started an NGO there, Sneha, Society for Nutrition, Education and Health Action that works on issues of health, nutrition and violence in children, adolescents and women across urban slums. Sneha has also started working on palliative care in Mumbai. Uh, Dr. Meda has worked extensively on the promotion of breastfeeding and lactation man management and started the first human milk bank in the country at Sion Hospital in 1959. Her research has been on reducing mortality in newborns with low cost technology and on maternal health, nutrition and violence in the most vulnerable populations of, the, uh, of urban areas. I will now ask Joby to play her, play her video. And uh, would you, if you'd like to ask her any questions, please do so through the chat. Over to you, Joby. Can you see the screen? Are you able to see the screen, my screen? Yes, we can see the oh, screen, okay. but the, the sound is low. I can hear the sound. Is it clear? Yeah. Sound is not coming through. You can't hear anything. Actually, start the speaking. So we can't hear, no sound. During this pandemic. Today, all we think we... Not again. Can't hear? No, nothing. Oh. A faint voice was coming. Uh, so we, maybe you'll have to increase the volume a bit. Oh. 
Once you had to be nothing. Maybe we can go to uh, Ivan yeah, and then we can. Okay. We'll go to Deacon Ivan now and then come back to the uh, presentation after that. Yeah. Uh, so, Noela, you could uh, take over. Uh, Ivan is yeah. the guy we all want in our in a outreach program because Deacon Ivan is in charge of the Diocesan Youth Center in Bandra and he leads the youth ministry in the Archdiocese of Bombay. Ivan will share with us how our youth are responding to the current crisis and how they can help us in our endeavors to reach out to others. Ivan, yeah. all yours. Thank you, Sister Noela. Great joy uh, to be uh, talking to so many religious men and women. And I think the women are more in number than the men is what usually my priest friends tell me that there are more women religious. So, uh, uh, I think that I want to start in a very short note on, you know, uh, what was the rationale that we engaged in when the pandemic struck us? And, you know, my own memory is as a little boy of nuns is this, that 20 years and 30 years ago, sisters were only meant to be managing sacristies. I think we've evolved and graduated from that stage where we recognize women religious as partners who are capable of launching and vivifying the church. This is not to place the men religious in this group at the back burners, but that's a joy. And so I think that we now have religious who are well equipped with, uh, you know, to walk with times. So I was thinking, well, how do I start with? And all that could come into my mind was, you know, the famous uh, management scientist, Peter Drucker, he coined what we call the MBO, that is management by objectives, which is a definition that guides by goals and needs of the group. But I'm not going to give you MBO by Peter Drucker. I've chosen another Salesian priest of great repute, uh, a Salesian priest called Father Rosanno Salla. He was the secretary of the Youth Synod in Rome, and he was uh, greatly involved in the process of the Youth Synod and even in the drafting of Christus Vivit. Uh, we had an opportunity through the goodwill of the Salesians to have him address youth ministers in the Archdiocese of Bombay when he was here in 2019. Uh, as I was researching his work already then, I found that he uh, spoke to a group of priests and bishops and educators in Rome, and he proposed a formula for youth ministry and I think this formula was what guided or animated me in uh, trying to work out what avenues the youth could be involved in. So the formula that he proposed was, again, an MBO. First M is, he said, mind the gap. The second, he said, is build, bridge the gap. And the third one, he said, overcome the gap. That's why MBO. First, he said, mind the gap, like at a metro station. You got to mind your step before getting in. Second, he said, build the gap or bridge the gap, which is to build relationships. And the third, he said, overcome the gap, which means the church should now make the first step and go out to the young people, requesting them to include them in its work of, you know, reaching out. So I think the first thing that uh, we decided at the youth center in collaboration with Bishop Barthol and Cardinal Oswald Gracious is that we need to make sure that our young people don't lose faith. And so we collaborated both at the archdiocesan level and also at the level of the diocesan youth center. And we started giving regular catechesis for youth right from the month of May uh, till as late as the month of uh, May, from last year till this May. So we had continuous catechesis for youth so to keep their spiritual life pepped up. So the paradigm that I took forward is to show them a mirror image where you got to allow them to say, how do I benefit or I'm taken care of and nurtured in this entire uh, situation of the pandemic. So first thing we started was catechesis. Uh, once the catechesis rolled in, we realized that youth, for them, the spiritual intake is not the primary thing as much as their emotional burdens. And so we decided to reach out to them in a different way 
and we launched in the archdiocese what is called the OCA, the full form of which is One Call Away. This was a helpline for young people from the age of 16 to 25, and we had a panel of four counselors on the team who could call our counselors to talk to them anywhere between 9 a.m. right up till 2 early morning, because very often these thoughts of suicide, depression, and anxiety attack our young people in the late hours of the night. So this one call away was available to our youth. And we've had over a thousand calls during this one year where young people would call not only from Bombay, but across country. We've had calls from transgenders who were about to commit suicide, eunuchs, and anybody was welcome, including those of other faiths. And I think my team has done an excellent job with this one call away. So we attended with the spiritual premise. Then we went to their psychological area or realm to reach out to them in their psyche. And one of the things that we've learned in this whole bargain is that the pandemic or COVID is not really a cause of depression. But a lot of the experiences in the lives of these young people in their growing years have been bottled and throttled and suddenly COVID has become that volcanic eruption where they've just, you know, kind of uh, erupted and it has taken a visible manner. I mean, just yesterday, Pope Francis mentioned that abusing a child, he, uh, he likened it to psychological murder. So a lot of these young people who were talking to our team members, we realized that these were issues of their home, of their family, of what has gone wrong in their childhood. And they were just coming to surface and that's what we were really dealing with because they didn't have that ventilating experience of going for six hours to college, hang out with their friends at bandstand or, you know, roaming around on the streets. They were stuck into their homes. So we realized that this was a great need. And this need led us to acknowledge that we're not able to heal them on the basis of an online call. And so then we initiated the next program called PW, the full form of which is Prayer Warriors where about 100 youth from the age of 16 to 25 again of the Archdiocese of Bombay have formed this prayer warriors group. We gave them a formation of two days. And then every three days, the youth would get a particular intention that he or she would repeatedly pray. The youth would themselves sing and record two hymns at the beginning or in, at the end with a scripture passage, and they would have to commit themselves for 25 minutes of daily praying for a particular intention for at least three days. So we had a hundred group of hundred warriors and this prayer warriors, uh, I kind of uh, let it ease in the month of December for fear of backlash from our parish youth directors who will say, that Deacon Ivan has started a parallel youth prayer group now and they will not get involved in the parish prayer group. So I asked them to get back to their base at the parish level. And I said, we will re respond as and when. But once this wave picked up in the month of April, once again, we've revived this prayer warriors group and we received on an average, at least 30 petitions for prayer, which uh, is driven by the youth. So I'm not really involved in this group. The youth have taken charge. They disseminate the petitions. They put the prayer songs, the passage, etc. And they're doing a marvelous job. I have a mentor who is part of the group. I'm just a silent observer in that group. So we started the OTA. Then we had the prayer warriors. So if you see, all these activities were driven towards a mirror look at themselves or what was disturbing their lives. Then I felt now we need to move beyond the mirror syndrome to the window outlook so that the outlook is beyond themselves to the outside world. And that's where I realized I did a little miscalculation. So I launched an activity called Servolution. That is the revolution to serve with love. And this was a program of reaching food grains to the migrants, to the poor on railway stations, etc. But because uh, there was the risk factor for young people getting infected, should I take them around with me? I had to redesign the whole program and get the youth not to come with me. And I just got the help of a few priests and adult mentors and animators. And we managed to take uh, food grain kits to about 750 families. Each food grain kit was about 800 bucks. We managed to reach these 750 kits to places right from the missions of Raigad, 
to Bhayandar, to Vikroli, to Are, to Sahar slums, to the whole city, you could say, we managed, except in the Bhayandar deanery, that deanery coordinator was a little bold and he said, I take responsibility for the care of the young people. But because I couldn't involve the young, I got a few youth in Bandra, so I would order these 1,000 kilos of rice or 2,000 kilos of sugar, dal, and the youth would be involved in just packing them, you know, in kilos and keeping them aside. But I didn't expose them to the going out and seeing the miseries of the poor who were suffering. So that was servolution. Uh, once servolution wrapped up in the month of October, it, it was meant to also celebrate the World Mission Sunday, which we celebrate in October. Then uh, we launched what is called in December, another program called Blessed Are Those Who Moan from the beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So the idea was, if you know any youth who has lost a mother or a father or a grandparent in the home due to COVID, the youth of the parish, just a small group of three or four, could make a small gift hamper and visit this family, make a little prayer with a goodie bag of Christmas, because they would not be celebrating Christmas. And so they would carry out this blessed are those who mourn by comforting them in this death of their family member, especially if it's a mom and a dad who has been lost to the disease. Uh, I myself went to several homes of the young people with a team member and a little goodie bag. So that's what we did in December. Then came January and I thought that my plan of servolution, which backfired, could now go ahead. So we launched the next program called CAS which is the full form of Carlo Acutis Squad. We all know that this beatified teenager, Carlo, was known to be giving sleeping bags to the poor on the streets of Italy. And so in his inspiration, we launched out CAS and we got as many as 400 young people across the diocese who took out bedsheets that were provided by the diocesan youth center. They went out to the streets and pavements after 10 o'clock in the night, and they put bedsheets on people who were sleeping there. And I think it was a brilliant uh, activity and outreach. And uh, I take everything that Father Nigel has said positively, and I know it has value. But I remember some three years ago, Bishop Percy in the priest group of the Archdiocese put a little comment. He said that, Whenever we go out to do some work of charity or good work, please leave your cameras behind home. Somehow this comment of his has, you know, etched itself in my mind. So I told all the youth that I am not looking for any of you sending me videos and sending me uh, pictures and, you know, floating your T-shirts off a cross because we're not doing this. Why? Yes, we are evangelizing in the name of Jesus. We are going out as brothers and sisters of one human family. This is not the time for us to advertise that we are, you know, making a signature move in the name of the cross. So I said, we go out as fellow citizens, somebody sleeping at 11 o'clock on the pavement. You don't wake them up to say, we are here to give you a bed sheet. You just open the bed sheet, drape it over them and move along. But I think this uh, event went very well and it was very well appreciated and taken by about 300 to 400 young people across the Archdiocese in the month of January. In the month of March, I wanted to launch a retreat called Kovadis, again for a smaller group, but because the cases began to increase, uh, we kind of then decided that we need to scuttle the idea for the moment. And so uh, that's the kind of programs that we've got the youth involved in. Having said that, I must say that the center works at the, as the apex body but really, we decentralize authority and we want the youth directors at the parish level to kind of oversee what are the local needs that need to be attended to. Because that is when we will have the help of the youth at the grassroots level. We do not want to impose an idea top down level. And we have encouraged the youth directors to take initiatives. And I think a lot of parish youth directors have taken initiatives with their young people going around doing a great amount of relief work within the parish campuses and ministries. So I think this is the kind of rough work that probably the youth center has been engaged in over this one year. I, for one, I am constantly driven by four A's in this uh, pandemic year. The first A is that I 
acknowledge that the needs are so great that there is a great amount of good that we can do. But the second A is that we've got to admit that we cannot do everything. The third A is then to accept that which is really doable, that which is really doable. For example, the servolution idea, I had in mind to just reach out to about 250 families. And finally, we reached out to about 750. That, and in terms of the financial uh, uh, involvement to defray the expenses, it is a so sort of a burden because I did not want to burden the Archbishop's house or the financial administrator. I just got my personal friends involved in these projects. They contributed, whether it is in terms of the food grains or the bed sheets to 1,300. We even gave to an NGO in Kalyan. I was not very keen on giving them because my uh, mental concept was I want young people to experience the vulnerability and the stark naked reality of seeing people on the streets. But this NGO founder told me that we deal with kids who are working in brick tins outside Kalyan. So because kids were involved in this work of slavery, really, I overlooked that and I gave them 100 bed sheets also from the DYC. So the whole idea has been accept what is doable. And then the last A is act with courage. And I take to heart that verse from the book of Timothy, that we have not received a spirit of timidity and fear, but love that is agapos, power which is dunamis, and of sophronismos. That is a sound mind, sound mind, which I think is very important in the context of the pandemic. And that's where I cannot put the young people to risk by getting them, you know, worked up or provoked or teased because their lives are at stake. And now having known that the 18 plus 45 category, we've withdrawn vaccinations for them. Their parents are very skeptical about them getting involved, even if they're willing. So I think this sound mind principle is something I am constantly keeping in my mind about how much to get them involved and where to draw the line. So this has been the kind of uh, a skeleton that I've tried to add flesh into over the one year. My experience has been positive and I want to make a comment here that I'm greatly inspired. I hope I don't sound like a feminist to the men religious in this group but I am absolutely teased and engineered with inspiration because of the women religious in the diocese and in the country. For example, the CCR sisters, after they got to know about my work at uh, Servolution, again in December, January, they flushed my center with about 500 kilos of grain so that I could reach out again to others. Or I look at the uh, Daughters of the Cross of St. Joseph's Convent, Bandra, their provincial has been kind to lend me two of their sisters in my youth ministry. And one of these sisters is involved in my one call away because she specialized in counseling. And not only during the pandemic year, I think even beyond the pandemic, I've been blessed. The Fr Franciscan Hospitaller Sisters, uh, Sister Marjorie, their provincial also offered the DYC, the services of Sister Queenie. So I think for us, uh, what I'm looking at here is once COVID is over, my strong comment is I think that women religious need to be a little bit more into the limelight and get active in the drama of parish youth ministry. And I think you will agree that we are by far in uh, you know countable digits in terms of our involvement in the official parish youth movement. But exemplary, every time I take a walk, uh, to Hill Road at Bandra, I see the Apostolic Carmelite Sisters distributing food to the poor. And from what my own, uh, you know, little knowledge I have, this is not an activity only born out of the pandemic. Before Corona hit them itself, they were doing this work of giving food. So while I wanted to collaborate with them, I said, no, women have the power and the capability of running, uh, you know, activities and work driven by the spirit. So I, I say hats off to them. And also to the many men who've collaborated with the Diocesan Youth Center, encouraging us, providing for new ideas of how we can work. So this is in a simple framework of what we've done in the Youth Center. If any one of you have questions or have ideas, we also launched, we realized that I read an article that talked of compassion fatigue. 
So, you know, in the month of August, we launched a very light program called Dates with DYC, again, which was hosted by the youth. And we had youth as, uh, you know, celebrities on the show, a young girl who went for weightlifting, 19-year-old girl went for weightlifting at the Asian level, a 20-year-old girl who went for uh, boxing at the national level. We used a youngster who went to the missions of the Northeast for two years and gave her services there to an NGO looking after AIDS kids. We had Sister Bina from the, like this, uh, the mentors who would tell the youth the work they do, because I believe the future of youth ministry must be intergenerational, as Pope Francis has highlighted in Christus Vivit, that the older generation must walk a company with the young. It is not leaving the young alone. It's not one at the cost of the other or worse still denial of the other, but we walk with each other and accompany each other. So I invited Sister Bina to share their work as a mentor to inspire young people. So I made sure that there was a woman religious on the date with DYC. We had young priests share their vocation story. We had a young doctor who shared his passion for music, which would appeal to young people. I invited a dancer who won America's Got Talent on the show, and he's a Catholic boy to share about how to pursue your passion. So we had this lighter show to combat the corona fatigue that young people were going through. So these were uh, broadly the activities that we I'm open to questions. I think I've spoken enough. Sorry. Yeah, thanks, Ivan. Thanks, Ivan, for that sharing. Thank you very much. You've given a comprehensive view of what you have done, and we got a taste of it. Also, for uh, mentioning uh, the sisters who have actually collaborated with you and uh, and that's the point also of the sharing that um, we get a, a, a kind of a, an idea about how religious can also cooperate in your work. And um, there is a, a kind of a appreciative message coming in from Rani George, Mudita, so there and Matt Coutinho on the chat box for you for your work. And uh, that's a kind of a real appreciation for your sharing with us and also um, sharing with us the kind of inspiring work that you do. So uh, open uh, for questions and uh, a little bit of time for discussion. Yeah, while the question, a uh, couple of questions may be coming, uh, if you have something more specific to tell us about how the religious can uh, co collaborate with you specifically on some of these initiatives that you may have in your mind for the future. Yeah, I, like, for example, one thing that I'm certain is that the religious can contribute in a great way. Because you see, when it comes to uh, helping young girls, it may be difficult for us as priests and deacons to step into the soul of what young girls feel. And I, I feel this tremendous lack of women religious in our youth ministry. I Pardon me now if I'm sounding a little pessimistic. But sometimes I get the impression that because we are religious, whether men or women, we are sometimes bogged down with our specialized charism and apostolate that we give all our energies, our talents and potentials to the best latitude possible towards furthering our uh, charisms that we are not found on the parish turf leading the young people. And I think if we can involve uh, the sisters getting involved in this domain, so many things can be done. I remember, for instance, Dr. Armida is not here, but about four years ago, Dr. Armida tried to launch a program in collaboration with Holy Family. Sister Bina was also there. She talked to the Bandra Deanery Fathers of keeping defibrillators in different zones of family and uh, empowering young people of you know, how to take care if someone has had a heart attack. So if we had these machines, our young people would be empowered, but I don't know whether this took off. I think at the ground level, if our sisters can use these schools and premises and empower, for example, teaching girls how to do these stuff and how to engage in this, I think it, it, it's kind of a great initiative. I think we can do much greater work. I think this collaboration, this acknowledging that the women can team up with others is great. I mean, before I came to the DYC, let me acknowledge it was difficult to get women involved in the diocesan youth center. I had a tough time, but praise God, uh, uh, Sister Marjorie, the provincial of the Franciscan Hospital of Sisters, Sister Vinita of St. Joseph's Convent and the provincial of their congregation 
have been forthcoming. But I think that we can find ways and means of how we can work at larger levels. You know, many of you women have schools. So I think you have a whole category of ex-students that you can form a little warrior group of how you can disseminate information of how can you use uh, the girls to come to a school in an environment that is safe. And probably like Father Nigel said, we could send adults to collect through the SEC data and Xerox copy of Aadhaar cards. And then in Wi-Fi zones and the safety of our schools, we allow them the use of computers because we have computer labs, for example, in our schools. They can get the COVID registration done. They can take printouts with their numbers, submit it to the family back through a post box. You don't have to meet the family physically. But our senior citizens who are not technologically advanced, leave alone senior citizens. I had a little tough time getting my own vaccination details filled in for the registration. So, I mean, these are ways in which we can motivate one another and do great work. I'm not saying that the sisters aren't doing enough or the men religious are not doing enough. But I would agree with Father Nigel, not to offend my dear friend, the Pauline sister who uh, said, uh, is the church on that retirement mode? But I think we're trying to play too safe. And this is not to make a comment on my own courage or whatever. I want to say that I've taken the COVID test about nine times in this one year. Because if I'm going out in the streets giving food grains or bed sheets, and I'm interacting with the poor on the streets, and the next week I have, I started face-to-face -face counseling from December onwards. So if I'm going to meet youth at my center in Bandra, they are going to be vulnerable vulnerable if I'm not safe. So every time I closed an activity and I was inviting people to the center, I had to be responsible to take a COVID test as much as even I have a little bit of fear. Have I got the, uh, the virus? But I, I got to say that we've got to move on. Yeah, so I, and I, I'm also very happy about sisters who pray for us. Huh? The, for example, I know the sisters adorers at uh, Marol, or, or the other sisters who keep telling me that we pray for your work, that's what we are doing. So I think that's great work for us too, that you pray for us. Uh, Sister Pauline has a question. Sister Pauline. She needs to unmute herself. Okay. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Ivan, uh, I want to congratulate you. I want to congratulate you on your wonderful work among the youth uh, and for acknowledging that you are a feminist. I want to tell you that feminist is uh, not a biological characteristic. It is a thought structure. There are many women and men feminists. Therefore, you can be happy that you are one. <laughs> feminists have got an inclusive vision. Therefore, we call Jesus also feminist. I'm not only happy, so I'm happy proud. that sister. you are one. And you have to be proud of that. Very proud. Very proud. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think you are doing a wonderful work. I really am very much impressed by your commitment. Yeah. Uh, that shows that See, this is what I mean. We are all church people. Church does not belong only to the clergy and the ordained people. It is for all. So you, I, I am very much impressed by your commitment. Thank you. God bless you. Yeah, even that was not a question. It was a pat on the back. Okay. <laughs> let me let me just acknowledge a comment um, that a lot of people enjoy uh, bashing up the hierarchy. And God bless their boxing gloves. I have no problem if they want to do that. But I will be very honest and sincere in stating that I have a hundred percent backing of the bishop in charge of youth ministry, Bishop Barthol. I have his eminence, Cardinal Ozzy, always encouraging me, making calls to me and telling me that don't step back. You are doing right. And I think all that I'm doing is only blessed by the hierarchy. I am amply supported. So without their support, and their constant guidance, I would not be able to do as much. Both the Cardinal as well as Bishop Barthol have uh, been rallying behind all my efforts. And I know that when I consult them, it is on the path of wisdom. So I needed to make that comment. 
any questions to challenge me are welcome also uh even uh there is uh to build on what you are saying about uh the the, the women and collaboration of women uh in the ministry, there is a very pointed suggestion from Manisha Gonzalez in the chat. As far as I can understand, the parish youth director is always a priest. Why? Could there not be a collaboration in this role? Very, very relevant question there. With the women religious, well trained or experienced and very interesting. I, I know you, you, I mean, I don't think, I mean, this is a very structural question which needs to be addressed at a different level. But if you would like to say something on this, you're welcome. Yeah. Sister, I would like to congratulate you and I like to provoke and tease you to get your provincial, first of all, to commit to sending your own sisters in youth ministry, because then uh, this suggestion will have a certain sense of a spinal backing. I am absolutely in favor because I can tell you that sitting at the diocesan youth center with 123 parishes, there are as many as about 35% of parish youth directors who are not really men to you know, guide or animate young people. And not every priest can be a magnetic factor for young people. I would therefore encourage that young women who are men for this ministry and train should step in. And I think the change will happen when young women in the religious say, we're willing to take on charge at the level of the parish to be the parish youth directress and animate. I would welcome you if a, a religious in this diocese is saying that I'm not welcome at the parish level. I am making a public statement here. As long as I am in the diocesan youth center, I'm extending a hand of invitation on behalf of the youth center that you can join the team of the diocesan center as an animator, as a mentor. I will respect your capabilities, your talents, and we will make sure your potential is fully utilized for the services of the youth. At the parish level, yes, we need to bring some, uh, you know, revolutionary changes, but I think there are parishes which are open to this. I know, for example, when Father Warner was in uh, St. Jude's Parish, Ballard, he was very open to the sisters uh, taking charge. So I think it all depends on the rapport and the relationship between the parish priest and the assistants there. But I look at this as a possibility. Pope Francis has made a new commission to study women diaconate I don't think this is a matter to be even discussed. That means to lead a parish movement doesn't need approval from Rome or even the archdiocese. I think we could just say, I'm willing. I, I would encourage this. I would encourage this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other query? <coughs> I think that's it, uh, Ivan. Thank you. Uh, we are just right on time. So we will go to the next session. Thanks. Thanks for your sharing. Thank you. And Thank also you. for taking the time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we go to the, the next uh, uh, presentation. I hope by now we will get the sound actually uh, uh, done. So, Joby. Joby. Yeah, Joby. Members of CRI and my dear. Joby's post. Friends. Sister Noella invited me today to share a few thoughts of what we as CRI could collectively focus on and deliver during this pandemic. Today, all we think, feel, see, fear is COVID. This term haunts us day and night. The media, the mobile, the telephone, all the calls are COVID or COVID related. This pandemic has simply taken over our lives. We have family members, a friend, a neighbor, a patient, someone or the other suffering from COVID. Some isolated at home, quarantined in a center, or perhaps admitted in the hospital. Some are dying. Worse still, some have passed away. My first thought, therefore, today, and Sister Noella asked me to talk to you all this, Take care of yourselves first. Yourselves, your physical health, your emotional health. Take some time to rest, relax, plan beyond COVID, days beyond COVID. Take time so that you make sure that 
people you work with, your family members and the people you work at, whatever the center, the hospitals, dispensaries, wherever, they also are safe. This is our first priority. The country needs each and every one of you and you have to be well to save the lives of others. The media is filled with unavailability of beds, of medicine, of life-saving oxygen, lack of vac vaccine. But what we mostly see are cities and towns. And we as a part of CRI need to ask ourselves this question. What is happening in our slums? What are happening to these communities in the villages and in the tribal areas? These are areas where health facilities are negligible. Leave aside oxygen or ICU. The poor and the vulnerable are the hardest hit. And not just hit as far as health is concerned, but hit uh, because they may not have food, they may not have jobs, there is so much. And therefore, if we collectively want to do something, then our focus has to be them, the poor and the vulnerable. There are so many needs that they have, and I'm not here to talk about all their varying needs. I can only, what I know little of, is talk about health. And my first thought, I know we come from all different backgrounds, and my first thought, because I've been in hospitals for long, is uh, what is it that we can do and in our hospitals, we have so many of them. And I would ask the question, can we treat, I know we are treating all types of patients, they all need to be, but can we treat the poor who come or call the poor in and treat them at subsidized rates or even free? I'm sure you will ask me, that's a great thought, but where are we going to get funds to run our hospitals if we see uh, many of them free or at subsidized rates. And I want to tell you something because this has been our experience. Today, the whole world is looking at India. There are so many donors who want to help, but we don't know where to look and how to look. And big organizations, people who are doing good work, what they have is they have a dedicated person or a dedicated team just looking for how to get funds, not because we want funds for ourselves, we want funds to subsidize and see our poor patients free, buy, get, make sure they get their medicines free. I think this is one thing that we in our hospitals can do, and we don't have to eat you. And therefore I would say, look at a team rather than just one person who are good at fundraising and they will find out where to get it. And many, many people will come forward. Believe me, they will come forward. The second thing that I would like to talk about is prevention of COVID as a collective role, prevention of COVID, and not in the general community, but I'm talking about the poorest communities. And let's talk about the slums. How do we spread this message? It has to be spread verbally through media, radio, mobile, pamphlets. You know what all we see on the media most is frightening stories of people dying, dead, crematoriums, or we are seeing uh, that this is not available. Instead, I think po positive messages, how do you prevent, spend time in how to prevent COVID, how to treat them in the initial thing. So what is it we have to keep telling them? Keep telling them that they need to mask. And I think we need to one step further, distribute masks to the poor and make sure they are taught how to use them. We have, you know, how exactly over the nose, below the chin, how to disinfect, this has to be taught. Social distancing may not be possible in slums like us, to whatever extent, sanitizing and vaccination. Let me tell you our own experience in SNEA. I have started over 20 years ago, I started um, an NGO called SNEA in the slums of Mumbai, and we work in the most vulnerable slums in the Ravi, in Mankur, Malwani, Mankur is the dumping ground. Malwani are very poor, and Bivandi, you must have heard of Bivandi, which are all poor funds. And when COVID started, through our good fortune, 
many of our community organizers and our volunteers were actually living in the slum. So we made the most of it. You know, they, so we, what we did is we quickly prepared training material about all these prevention aspects. We train people, our uh, workers on the mobile, and we've sent these messages. And in a short period of time, verbally people next door through mobile, through their friends, this uh, you know, prevention of COVID went across the slums we were working in. So I think that one focus is, you know, how can we help them and train them in prevention? The second thing I think we did in our NGO, which is worth sharing with you all is, we worked in a close collaboration with the Municipal Corporation of Greater Mumbai. You know, we it's difficult to work in silos. If we work by ourselves, we don't have a big reach. You know, it can't reach many people. So we work with the government. We work with the Municipal Corporation. And in Dharavi, we... The corporation did a wonderful job. They got all the NGOs together. And our role was, at that time, you know, they were segregating people, segregating a large number of slums where they were, there was COVID. And they provided food in, to and through their homes. And our job was to provide uh, fruits and vegetables. Other NGOs provided grains and things like that. So across the slums, so uh, there was no spread of um, COVID in the Ravi. It was a great thing. So collaborating with existing people and therefore wherever you work, try and collaborate with them. Uh, the third is that, you know, we did was we, um, the domestic violence has increased during these COVID times. And in our, in SNEA, we have a very good program on prevention of violence against women and children. And same with our volunteers and community, the word spread and therefore the number of calls, you know, they double treble during these times on counseling, what needs to be done, how to prevent, how to reach out for help, all this we did in the COVID times. And the last thing I'd like to share with you, perhaps may be useful is, you know, there are a whole lot of schemes for the poor and this yojana and that yojana. And, you know, there is money for the vulnerable communities, but they don't know how to use it. So what we did is we helped our communities understand and make use of these yojanas. And in a big way, ration. So many people didn't have ration cards, how to get the card, how to make the most of the ration. So these are the things that we did. Another um, aspect that I feel um, that we, collectively we can do is, you know, how to ensure that our poor and vulnerable are vaccinated. You know, you look at people who are mobile, they go home in apps, or register for them, and then they go and get um, uh, get vaccinated but many of our poor some have mobiles many of them don't have they don't know and the registration is not easy so help them to register so once they register then mobilize them and ensure they reach the place where they can be immunized i also think it's very important because there are lots of um, the people have heard a lot of stories about immunization. You know, these stories spread the fastest. Patient dropped dead one day afterwards, post-immunization. But the 99.9 .9 people who survived and didn't, so these are the stories. The second is, they took two doses yet caught. But if you look at the millions who have got it, then a very small percentage really get uh, COVID and many of them, a majority of them will recover without serious complications. So we have to explain to our people and about these fears, telling them they shouldn't worry uh, too much and make sure that they get vaccinated. And of course, we all know that there's a shortage of vaccines and that is a big problem today. And therefore, what we need to tell uh, is we raise our voices and demand vaccine. You know, one thing uh, that has happened, and, you know, I know most of the hospitals, at least here in the city, the, our hospitals all have started vaccination. So that's, I know, hospital will start. But another thing is that one of the churches in Bombay, the Mahin Church, corporator got in touch with the corporator, and they have become a vaccination center. So if we have churches, if we have schools, we have the space, then we can get in touch with the local government authorities, you know, offer our spaces for the 
for uh, for uh, vaccination that is and uh, we'll say we can offer them for the poor and the most vulnerable so that is uh, one thing that we can think of but let me tell you my greatest greatest fear is the disaster that is awaiting us as some of it has happened much to be happened is what is happening to our villages across the country over 70% of our population live in these villages i don't have much experience i know many of you who are here today are actually working in these villages and in the tribal areas and you all must be doing an amazing job i just want to share some points that i came across you know the um the community health department of the uh, cmc vellor has brought out a document on how to respond to the covid crisis at a village level and some uh, good ideas because you know we, we quickly need to get it so they say first identify centers where um, the people can be uh, kept if they have to be isolated quarantined and where would you get it in the villages they said the panchayat itself could be our schools or a church we have one it could be halls that they have in villages so identify the centers where we people can be sent the second they said the most important i we all know the person who is there in the village is asha worker and the anm that comes off and on so these asha workers and anms have to be trained and this will you know be trained and all of you who have community workers in these villages have to be trained in the uh, protocols of identifying covid and you can easily you would know the protocol there is the fever or a sore throat loss of smell all the symptoms of covid so they have to be trained to identify this so when they visit families and they identify can the can the person be isolated in their own home do they have an additional room and if not then they need to you've already identified centers they need to be sent to that centers so this is the second that thing that happened actually to start with i i i have to say that this uh, planning can only be done at the village level you can need not have a directive from top the village panchayat all the communities in that village get together and they need to plan it so the planning is at the local level they have identified the places and they've kept it ready so once identified what if these what happens to these patients and these patients need to be monitored and they will be monitored by temperature taking a temperature pulse oximeter should be given at that level to check their oxygen levels and if they are dropping then they say the primary health center could be one area that or where oxygen is made available and people with dropping oxygen could be kept at that center easily said i, I don't know i in many parts of india yes the primary health center works many they they don't but whatever we can whoever the doctor or the nurse they should be are keeping oxygen ready for these patients the fourth step of course is if they deteriorate what do you do to this patient where do you transfer and uh, you know that the next phase is the district hospitals unfortunately uh, you know how do you know there is place in the district hospital will they be admitted or will be they kept outside in the ambulance and therefore they have suggested it is uh, possible in many states for example kerala tamil nadu even Na uh, uh, maharashtra a website we can see the the number of beds in the district hospital and if there are beds then transfer the patient it's not going to be easy but this is something that needs to be uh, that needs to be planned and that and basic treatment you know unfortunately today there is such a lot of rubbish people are treating and over treating giving all sorts of things for covid some don't do any good and some might actually do harm so whatever basic initial treatment should be based on scientific protocols and that scientific protocols should be followed then rt pcr what they have suggested is that that it should be done you know in a mobile in an uh, 
mobile van and then they go through different villages at a time rotate and come back so people who are positive can they can do the rt pcr confirm and sometimes you need to confirm because are we really dealing with covid or something else so that is uh, that is something that has been suggested at the uh, village level and those of you all who are, who are working at that level need to talk to your local panchayats the local locals there and you can plan it what you can really plan and must push is uh, vaccinations of people in the villages you know when you see uh, pictures now unavailability of vaccine you'll see all cities all people well dressed the well to do are going for vaccination i've not seen queues of poor people in villages either getting vaccinated or maybe the the press hasn't reached there but we don't see them have they got their first vaccine will they get the vaccine so this is something for those who work in rural rural areas to push for make sure that their population is vaccinated and like i said before you need to prepare them you need to tell them the advantages why they need to take it and reassure them about the vaccine so that is uh, the thing that i i thought may be useful the last thing i want to talk to you and then i end my talk you know in um, in uh, the city of mumbai we have a poor health outreach group this group was um, started by bishop alvin i'm one of the people that are you know a team leader but who's the most important persons working there is the coordinator dr richard pereira and a small group of doctors who are doing an amazing job we started this pre covid thinking that we finished off with covid and we were we were looking at the health of the most vulnerable population in our archdiocese and we had churches register so we would know which population to deal with identify the parish coordinators in that parish with help of the parish priest and then try to ensure that these uh, the poorest poor would get uh, either free or subsidized uh, um uh, uh, diagnosis uh, treatment even hospitalization we have a, a whole group of doctors willing to give uh, medical advice on phone so they could call up our doctors specialists on the helpline talk to them in case they had a medical problem and then if they need a treatment then they would go and then we would say there would be subsidized pharmacies or laboratories and all municipal facilities that are free would speak to people and get them admitted but once the covid uh, second wave started bishop alvin said do something and our team really rose up to the occasion and started a covid helpline with a team of doctors to give medical advice a big team to give all the other facilities that people wanted to know where to get drugs plasma beds things like that so was that there is the second team and the third team for counseling and psychiatric treatment we had a group of psychiatrists giving that treatment so this was the helpline that was created in the third wave we have more recently started in the same group of prayer line this is being used also today so this is something that we started in uh, mumbai for the archdiocese and i will send sister noella the details of that uh, um, you know uh, the velour uh paper that model that they have given and also of our the work the work of our core health group so any one of you all would like to so do something uh you know you i'm sure you could do that and much more and finally i want to say that i know you've done so much and you have many many ideas and the most important thing is to share it because you know i would know something you would know something and we have to learn from each other and therefore when we share ideas we learn from each other then we do a, a better job of what we are doing so finally continue doing the good work you are you are doing uh, but i like i said be uh, said before please stay well stay healthy stay safe so that you can reach out to the people who need you thank you so much
that was uh, Dr. Armida giving us some uh, very specific input uh, how we can be proactive at different levels. Uh, just to pick up a few points, uh, she talked about the need to harness uh, donors out there and uh, how we can actually uh, build up team, uh, teams to harness the kind of uh, generosity of other people who are out there to donate. Uh, collective role in prevention, which is very important. She talked about how this is the time for us to put more effort in harnessing schemes of the state for the poor. Uh, she talked extensively about uh, uh, rural areas, about vaccination issues, raising voice to demand vaccines. Uh, she uh, took points from the CMC Velour documentary and the document which she said she would share with Sister Noela, which will be available to anyone who would like to know. Um, something I, uh, to extend what she said is about, uh, you know, giving primacy to scientific protocols, uh, which is not only really important for us uh, to be proactive, but also important for us, uh, because I'm very sure a lot of us are getting a lot of information, scientifically sounding information, coming from very scientifically sounding people and we need to be very very careful giving primacy and importance to scientific protocols coming from a senior doctor like Dr. Armida is very important kind of a message for all of us today. So that's uh, in a nutshell and uh, uh, Noela's one question is there on the chat box which is okay which is you could uh, and there's a question which has come from Deacon Ivan back uh, just one question from Sister Joyana. Deacon Ivan, how do you plan to balance the protection of youth from contracting uh, COVID and keeping them active in social work? How do you keep the balance? How do you plan to do it? Uh, you're mu muted. You're muted, Deacon Ivan. You're muted. Yeah. yeah. I think the question is valid, sister. And I think the concern is really grave. See, earlier in the light of it not being, uh, when I started in October, I took all precautions. I ordered headgear each one with gloves, personal sanitizer, face mask. But now that we are talking that it is also airborne, the challenge is more grave to invite the young people to launch directly onto the field. So the only way that you can ensure that there is some level of safety is when the youth who are interested themselves have both the vaccination doses. Others' parents are unlikely. So my program on servolution hit a roadblock with a comment going around in Bandra that a youth was involved in relief work in the month of August and he contracted COVID and so he died. So he died. So you see that got me cautious. So unless and until we take this concern of the parents that your life is in danger and we get them to get vaccinated and the current scenario where 18 to 45 is knocked off the table, we've got to be very cautious. But what I can say is this, this is a great teaching lesson for the church that one of the lukewarm attitudes of parish youth movements is that the social dimension of ministry is very weak in youth apostolate. Now we will have to challenge youth directors to create that social conscience in our young people. And even if it doesn't happen at the parish level, because general youth only wants fellowship and fun, there might be parishes that have just five youth who are driven to a humane work. So then we need to have a group that functions at the deanery level if there are 10 parishes. So four into 10, you'll have a solid group of 40 young people who are driven with a social uh, conscience and their razor edge sharp in that conscience. That is the way the church can look to for forward. And we'll have to change our strategies. For example, you have SVP, Society of Vincent de Paul, but you'll have very few youth working that word itself doesn't appeal to them, Vincent de Paul. You will have to give them a new name called Being Human because Being Human is Salman Khan's group. And their belief is when you go out to do social work, don't bring Christian baggage and, you know, lapel pins on your shirts and dresses. So you have to give them a new tagline of Being Human and you have to touch creative ways to say, we will, and it will be a small group, but it will be a dedicated group. So if the whole diocese is divided into 11 deaneries, we can have 11 squads of young people who have a social uh, conscience that is high level and we can train them. Like Dr. Armida said, she's into palliative care. Could we train our young people who are sensitive towards, towards senior citizens with palliative care, not only because of COVID, but post COVID also we can have these warriors going around uh, with this and probably the others will get magnetized on the journey of life. But yeah, the risk is very high. And I can tell you any activity that now involves you, the bishop has told me to be very cautious that I cannot put their life at risk. And I, I've got to listen to 
the voice of wisdom. And I, I take Dr. Armida's point also. Unless we are safe and you're flying in an airplane, the first thing the air hostess announces is that you put your mask and be safe if you want to help others. You can't try to put the mask on your baby. That won't work. So you've got to be safe. I know, for example, in April, I was to fly to Nagaland for a youth convention of 1,000 youth. It was on 21st of April. And because of the conflict in my family that I should go or not go, I just took Bishop Barthol's opinion. And he said, no, Ivan, I'm not giving you permission to leave. You're being stupid. Now you're crossing the line of courage. You're doing foolish things. I take away your permission. You will not go anywhere out of Bombay to do these things. So I think this uh, parameter of being sensitive to young people is very important because if a parent loses a child, I think they will never forgive us and it will be a stigma. It is, it is a scar that will never heal. And so I have to be careful as the rest of us have to be careful, you know. So I think we have to go cautiously. If the vaccination thing was taken care of, until that weaning period is there, till the vaccination gets uh, activated, we could have created teams of training these young people in a school with social distancing and doctors giving advice and a program for them to equip them. But in the present scenario, knowing that it is an airborne thing, no matter how careful you are, you could just be a carrier of the virus. So I think we need to be a little cautious on that. Thanks, Ivan. Thanks, Ivan. And uh, yeah, we are more or less through. Um, there is one... Um, Couple of comments there. Beware of doctors with degrees on WhatsApp University. Uh, yeah, Manisha Gonzalez, I warm up to the formation training of some small youth groups with a heightened social conscience that can be a model to others. Two appreciative notes and one word of uh, caution. Uh, so, more or less, we have come to the, uh, the conclusion of uh, today's uh, um, sharing. And uh, the questions to Dr. Armida will be passed on to her. Now I uh, request Sister Cyril to uh, to propose the word of thanks. You are muted. You are muted. You are muted, Sister Cyril. Ah, okay. Yeah. We are proud of each of you, dear Dr. Richard Pereira. Father Nigel Barrett, Dr. Armida Fernandez, and Deacon Ivan Fernandez. Your sharing has been excellent, informative, very clear, focused, practical, enlightening, challenging, straightforward, inspiring. On behalf of CRI Expo, we are deeply grateful to you for your presence with us. Thank you. God bless. Thanks, uh, Srila, for that uh, uh, word of thanks to the, the resource persons. I'm sure we have had a very resourceful and rich evening. And uh, once more, thanks to everyone who joined uh, today. I can see right now 82 logged in devices, which will be the numbers will be much more at uh, one time we had around 94, 95. So with this, we uh, uh, come to a conclusion of this. Uh, a special thanks for the initiative taken by the executive committee, every member, uh, Noila for taking the initiative all through and pushing it through and uh, with uh, the very short deadline. Uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you. So maybe we could log out. Uh, Noila, anything more to say? No, thank you. Okay. Just yeah. thanks for coming. Fine. Let's uh, at one time. Yeah, ninety-nine participants, ninety-nine devices at one time. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, one and all. Let's. Uh, we are closing the thing. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Thank you for the empty. MT is gone. If you could yeah. just stay back two minutes, the Exco team. Yes, yes. Exco team can stay back. Others can go. I think. The MT also is gone. MT is gone? <laughs> he must be having another meeting or something. Mm. All right, then we'll, we'll come back later. All right. Yes. Okay, so we leave that. Yes, yes. But it was a good session, wasn't it? Yes, yes. It was it good. Was yeah, I can go back and uh, cancel, I think. What?
No, no. All right. See you, sister. Thank you, Joby. Thank you. Thank you, Mudita. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Leo, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Joe. Bye. 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 Just one time. Yes. If I have to put a string on top, let him join us. It was very enlightening, actually. So we meet some other time then, Joby. Joby is also gone. Everybody is. Thank you, Sarila. That was a good job. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Well, it told me one minute. <laughs> yeah, that's okay because we finished at six o'clock. Yes. So we leave then. Yeah. And we can meet some other time. Yeah. Okay.